Sister Barb, what is your father's first and last name? So, Gabe Guerrero. Gabe Guerrero. Well, Gabe, we're very glad that you're with us tonight. We've prayed a lot for you. And so we, uh, we want the Lord to bless you very much. We're very glad you're here with us tonight. <clears throat> tonight we're going to be in the sixth chapter of Ephesians, the 15th verse. This will be our 79th lesson in this uh, book. Now the genius of salvation is intriguing to a thinking person anyway. It's intriguing because it involves the activity of God and Christ and the Holy Spirit and the holy angels. And there may be like cherubim and seraphim and four living creatures and 24 elders and spirits of just men made perfect and a host of other personalities. And it's associated with an eternal purpose, which is a concept that uh, is difficult to grasp because there's nothing like that in the world. Like you, you have like the Word of God, the personality of the Word, becoming flesh. There's a vicarious or substitutionary death that's at the root of things. There's a triumphant resurrection and ascension into the heavens, and the unparalleled ex exaltation of the man, Christ Jesus. We have his intercession and the mediation of a new covenant. That's, it's remarkable for scope. That's, what, that's the, what's supporting this. What I just went over is what's supporting salvation. <clears throat> Salvation initiated by a call and is activated to the individual by faith. Now at this point, there's a number of interesting observations. Salvation is from this present world, and yet we're working out our salvation in the world. It includes deliverance from subservience to the devil, and yet you remain in the territory over which he reigns. We're delivered from the guilt and power of sin, but we still must struggle against sinful propensities. <laughs> yeah, the reason I'm going over this, it, it confirms why you have to have the whole armor of God. We're citizens of heaven, but we don't fully reside there yet. The flesh has been circumcised from us, but it remains in our bodies. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We've been joined to the Lord, and yet we're absent from him. We've been created in Christ Jesus, and yet we continue to be changed from one state to another. To another, we've been justified from all things, yet are constructed to confess our sins that we might be forgiven and cleansed from all unrighteousness. Satan's been destroyed, and we still have to resist him. Jesus has plundered principalities and powers, but we've got to wrestle them. We've been reconciled to God, but we still need an intercessor. <laughs> We've got access to God with confidence, but, but we still have to have an internal intercessor because we don't know what to pray for as we ought. We're told if God be for us, who can be against us? And yet some of God's people are martyred. And all that are godly, live godly, are persecuted. That's some of the complexities of it. <laughs> See, when people oversimplify salvation, and there's a, there's a significant move on, of, on foot authored by Satan, men aren't smart enough to come up with this strategy. 
has been authored by Satan to simplify salvation because the more you simplify it, the more you disarm. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's nothing simple about it at all. I just went over a few cursory things that I thought of mm -hmm. off the top of my head. Though such a person is, thinks that salvation is simplistic, the whole armor of God doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. All right, now our verse tonight is verse 15. <laughs> This has to do with having. This is a continuation of verse 14. Stand therefore having, then he mentions the loins good about truth, and here's the next thing to having, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Mm -hmm. Having. We're at the point in our text where preparedness is the objective. Before we take up the defensive shield and the offensive sword, there's uh, some things that have to be done. I say before you do that. You can't, like, pick up the shield at the last minute and pick up the sword at the last minute. you got to have this having in there. Now, ponder, uh, incidentally, there's a inordinate amount of preaching about what we should be, what we ought to be. And we understand that as necessary to do that. But that's not enough. There's got to be more said than what we should do. See, there's too much theorizing and suppo suppositions and men get together and they think they've really accomplished something if they discuss what we ought to be. Because some people really don't know what we ought to be. So they think it really have struck on something, you know. If you learn what you ought to be. And you're made a conscious of what you ought to do. But it doesn't mean anything unless you are what you ought to be and do what you ought to do. And until that happens, it, it's, just, it's just an idea. That's all it is. So it's good to know what we have, because that lifts it out of the theoretical, see? Now, as soon as we say we have, we're out of the theory of, of uh, theories and suppositions and hy hypothetical situations. We're, we're outside that domain. We're talking about what we have. And you think of the things that we have, just to mention a few, we have gifts. We have the spirit of faith. We have promises. We have all sufficiency in all things. All these things are mentioned here are preceded with have. We have a desire to depart. We have the same love one for another. Have nourishment ministered. Have boldness into the holy pleolist. We have a high priest over the house of God. Our hearts have been sprinkled from an evil conscience. We have an honest manner of living among the Gentiles. We have compassion to one another. We have a good conscience. We have escaped the corruptions in the world. These and other things are things we now possess. Amen. Amen. We have these things. They come in the package of salvation. But it's possible to have these things but not be as aware of them as we ought to be. So they tend to be neglected. Incidentally, it's what you have that makes your light light. Yeah, amen. If you didn't have anything from God, you couldn't let your light yeah. so shine. That's, that's what gives you the light. That's what gives you the, what you need to live is what you have. Not what you ought to have, what you have. As long as the people of God are in a state of ignorance, they'll not be able to live well. They'll make blunders, they'll make mistakes, they'll make errors in judgment, a lot of sorrow, unnecessary sorrow will accompany life, confusion will come in. As long as they remain in a state of ignorance about what they have and what they have access to, very important. We're talking about something that we have been given, the whole armor. Now, we've got to do something with it, but it's there. 
having is has carries the idea of obtaining. Yet you don't have it by nature; you obtained it by grace, by through faith. It has the idea of holding. If you have something, you you're holding it. It describes a state that can can confidently be realized. So God tells you, but these are things you can't see. You can't access them with any of your senses. Any of your natural person, it doesn't have it. None of your natural senses have access to any of these things. It's only faith that can access them, and the only way you know about them is God told us about them. Or we wouldn't know anything about these things at all. So it's imperative that God's people know who they are and what they have. And it's time well spent to keep this always before the people, not to let this, don't assume everybody knows this. And don't assume because there came a point in time when they did know it that they keep on knowing it. You've got so we we got to continually be bringing these things up and uh, building our reasoning around them, that sort of thing. One might imagine that being girded about with the truth and having the breastplate of righteousness, that's enough. We'll be able to do it now. We got a hold of the truth, huh? We've got this personal uprightness of character. We'll be able, well, that's not enough. There's the and. Amen. The and factor. Those who imagine that having your loins, it's like the loins of your mind, you know, but having a loin with you, having a, an apprehension of the truth, in other words, you know the truth. And having a breastplate of righteousness, you're, you're living soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And you may think, well, that's enough. Well, that's enough if all you were fighting was flesh and blood. <laughs> that would be enough. And we acknowledge that. That would be enough. But that's, that's not even the main foes we're fighting. In fact, we're not even fighting them. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. See, it's because of, it's because of these principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places and rulers of the darkness of the world. That's what calls for this whole armor of God. It's that condition that necessitates the whole armor of God. And your enemies, unlike flesh and blood enemies, don't let up. See, your enemies in the flesh, they'll give you some rest once in a while. <laughs> Maybe God makes them give us some rest, but these other enemies, they don't. God can restrain them, but they have kind of a long leash. Maybe you've experienced this. They have kind of a long leash. So he's reminded us we're not resting flesh and blood, so don't think about armor in terms of flesh and blood. You may be able to get up and out-argue somebody. And present your point and prove it more effectively than they can prove their point. But that's, believe me when I say we're not here to convince people that don't want to know the truth to convince them of the truth. We're going to make a valiant effort uh -huh. to be sure. Yeah. we got a battle we're waging. And we should not turn our attention to any kind of earthly conflict until we've engaged in this battle that he's talking about here. We're facing the wiles of the devil, his crafty strategies. He can outsmart you. If you're not living by faith, he'll outfox you. Adam could tell, tell you a lot about this. So Paul, as you moved us into a higher room of thought... He brought us up higher, and he said, ah, we're talking about the wiles of the devil who has deceived the whole world. See, he's had 100% success, except only for the Lord Jesus. That is the only person living on earth that has navigated through earth safely. Amen. It's the only one. 
And it's that circumstance that demands putting on the whole armor of God, see. Now the foes we are facing are between us and where we're going. <laughs> and their main purpose isn't like to make life miserable here, although they can. Their main purpose is to stop you from getting to the better country. And their activity demands more than you knowing the truth and being upright. Job knew all the truth that could be known at his time, and he was upright, and look what they did. So what should we do? Well, your feet have to be shod. Your feet. <laughs> you don't even get to the, yes, yeah, so they're, they're, the, the having part reminds me of Jesus saying, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that yeah. keeping part is the retaining. That's because right. The thief cometh not but for to steal. That's right. And the, the keeping part is what ensures that the word of God can do the work it came to do. Amen. And if it's taken from you, then the work stops. Amen. Yeah, where it stays, then it, it grows and You have it. Work. Yeah. It's very good. Amen. <laughs> Sometimes you mentioned that he can make your way hard or he can be, make your way... Sometimes it the opposites the way he chooses. He'll just make everybody your friend. Oh yeah. He'll make everything seem like it's just yeah. going fine to where you don't even think you need the armor. That's right. Yeah. Now the scriptures talk about the feet quite a bit, actually. We read in First Samuel, the Lord keeps the feet of His saints. The psalmist said, he'll not suffer thy foot to be moved. Solomon warned of associations with sinners. My son, walk not thou in the way of them. Refrain thy feet from their path. Again, he said, then shalt thou walk in thy way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. And again, ponder the path of thy feet, and let thy way, let all thy ways be established. Through Isaiah, he talked about, I want to make a point out of this. We're just kind of laying the groundwork here. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and thou shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, or finding thine own pleasure, or speaking thine own words. And then he says, you bless him. Jeremiah said, withhold thy foot from being unshod. Is that a good word? Huh? Those in Christ are warned, make straight paths for your feet. Amen. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. Some versions read, I understand turned out of the way means it will break your legs so you can't. Some people had to have their leg broken. They just were wandering all the time. That's God's remedy to wandering. Breaks your leg. At least he does that sometime. I'm not sure he does that all the time. But So our feet have to do with our walk. And our walk is our manner of life. <laughs> It's a kind of overview of how we're living, our walk. And the direction we're going, our, our walk. Our feet relate to carrying out the details of the walk. That's the details of the walk. It relates to carrying out how we move from place to place with our feet and how we adapt to the circumstances set before us. See, how do we reposition our, so our feet have to do with that? How are we going about shifting our spiritual posture from defense to offense? How, how, how do you handle, how's your feet? You gotta, your feet have to do with that. 
What is involved in making the transition from preaching to prison? How do you navigate that? Feet. We're talking about feet here. Our feet are also the means through which we take steps. Steps have to do with feet on the way. <laughs> that's where you read the steps of a good man are order to the Lord. See, the steps, that's what the feet, the feet take the steps. Referring to spiritual stability, the psalmist said, the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. He got, must have something on his feet. The psalmist again described the faithfulness his faithfulness in this manner, our heart is not turned back, neither have our steps to climb from thy ways. And I'm showing you here that in spiritual life, where you walk is important, where you're going is important, and how you walk is important. Amen. Referring to the tactics of the enemies, David said, they gather themselves together, they hide themselves, they mark my steps. They look at how I'm I mean, they can't get a good picture of the overall view of your life, but how you, how you move about in the world, they take note of that, they try and trap you. David said, prayed, order my steps in thy word. Jeremiah confessed, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself, it's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Paul affirmed the redeemed walk in the steps of our father Abraham. <laughs> At your feet, your feet what's taking the steps. And Peter referred to the saints' posture in suffering like this. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also has suffered for us, serving us an example that we should follow his steps. Like, like footprints in the sand or wherever. It's your feet. If you looked, if you looked at the steps, their foot, their footprints. <laughs> I think of the life of a believer this way. We're on a highway. Isaiah thirty-five eight says the highway of holiness. We're on this highway, it leads to glory. Our walk is an overview of our pilgrimage. Along the way, he speaks of the direction we're traveling and the progress we're making. Our feet have to do with the details of our walk. One of the details we're covering in our text is warfare. That's what's one of the details. And spiritual mobility with which we adapt to the circumstance. See, people say life is boring, they're just not doing much living. Living requires a lot of dexterity and movement. And if you don't have the right shoes on, you can't make these changes that are sometimes required. Sometimes you've got to, so to speak, shift gears. You've got to walk a different kind of way. Sometimes you've got to walk on rough terrain. Yes. Sometimes you can see it right there. The faith life is like walking on a tightrope. Yeah. There's not any room for varying. I mean, yeah. you, you got to go straight. That's you got to right. follow. If Jesus is walking that way and you decide that you, you, you just don't want to do it, well, you just you won't be with him because right. he'll leave you behind. See, right, right here we ought to know that. Oh, Brother Matthew, go ahead. Choose. Uh, Give you the kind of dexterity that you need to be able to walk circumspectly. Yeah, yeah that's right. Have, how always be aware of the wild yeah. of the devil to be able to face the opposition. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> now, right here, we have a lot of professing believers fail and and fail miserably. They like to call it making a mistake or made a bad judgment or however you want to call it. But their mistakes were because they weren't regarding the will of the Lord and their feet weren't shod. That's why they couldn't react 
correctly. They're unable to put on the whole armor of God. They can't put it on because they don't have the truth. They don't have an apprehension of the truth. But you can't go. You can't proceed one millimeter past that. If you don't, if you're not girt about with the truth, so the truth directs the way you think. Yeah, amen. Now, see, there's a lot of people. Truth doesn't direct how they think. Maybe it's the church tradition directs how they think. Maybe it's the latest book they're reading that directs how they think. Maybe it's their own will that directs how they think. But when your loins are girded about with the truth, the truth directs how you think. And if a person doesn't have a hold of the truth, he cannot think right. Amen. So he'll be overthrown. Whenever a person has the knowledge of the truth, that's what makes each step purposeful. That's right. Was considering the, the difference between someone who changes direction or makes an adjustment like you were talking about and a person who falters in a step is yeah. the surety of their step. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, how purposeful each step was. The, the one who falters, can, his whole direction can be changed just by doubt or mm -hmm. That's unsurety, right. but That's right. whenever you have the truth, then your steps are sure and established, each one. Amen. Yeah, there's a direct connection between light, truth and light as well. Oh, yes. Course, Amen. You walk in the light, you know where you're going. That's Amen. right. If you're not in the light, you don't know and you stumble and fall. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, notice our text says, having your feet shod. Most of the versions do read shod. Some read fitted. Back when I was a boy and you bought a pair of shoes, you had to be fitted. You, you just didn't go up to a shelf and get a pair of shoes. There was no, <laughs> there was no such thing as that. You had, to, you had a person measured your foot and, and, and they got your shoe. You never stepped at a showcase window. You never saw what shoe they had unless it was in the showcase. Fitted. Some versions say, instead of shod, they say have shoes. Some versions say sandaled. Murdoch says, defend your feet. Now the word shod actually means bind under one's feet. A single word, in the Greek it means to underbind. So these aren't fashion shoes we're talking about. Shoe horses, we called it shod because shod, that, that's right. Because of that very definition, that's right. it's yeah. bound. You, you bind it to the bottom. That's of the, right, to the, the bottom feet. of the foot. That's right. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shod. So we're talking about the bottom of the foot, the part that touches the earth. That's the part. The in the earth, the upper part of the shoe is the most important part. Nobody buys shoes because of the bottom part, unless they're like a construction man or something. They always, you bike with the top part. But the top part's not the point here. The bottom part. Feet that are shod are covered with a protection so their feet are protected from the surface on which they're standing or walking. Now, here an important uh, distinction ought to be made. You going to say something, Brother Matthew? Whenever I worked in fast food when I was younger, they made you buy slip-resistant shoes, right? <laughs> <laughs> because Amen. Of the, the tread on the bottom of them. Amen. You know, these are slip-resistant Still important, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. When Moses' holy men stood before God... They had to take their shoes off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Moses was told, take off your shoes. Mm -hmm. Joshua was told the same thing. Yeah. Take off your shoes. Yeah. When Stephen is recounting Moses, he said he was on holy ground. <clears throat> now on holy ground... Your feet don't need protection. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Go ahead, Judah. Removing of the shoes also shows that there's nothing between. That's right. That's right. 
No, which means it's safe. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's nothing between blocking, right. blocking the um, interchange. Yeah. Between us, See if you're walking on gravel, we, you know, we advise <laughs> shoes. Yeah, that's right. When you're standing before God, you make direct contact with the holy ground. You won't want anything standing between you and the ground. But some people try to come before God with shod feet. Oh, yeah, they do. They arm themselves a certain way, so they have a certain kind of mindset. They're not thinking about God. They're thinking of themselves, and they got something on their feet. So get your shoes off. You know, my working environment, mm -hmm. you know, you're working around a wet floor, you got to have mm -hmm. non-slick shoes. That's so right. It kind of reminds me of the people that I work with. They're mm -hmm. thinking about themselves like, oh, I won't slip. And then when they do slip... Yeah, they got to get non-slick shoes. They should have thought about that. Didn't have yeah, the right shoes. <laughs> yeah, there's some environments or some grounds that you'll actually get defiled from. Oh, yeah. I mean, so you got to <laughs> yeah. have the shoes on there, so you got to have right. wisdom and knowing <laughs> what ground you're on. See, it's possible to come near to God and you have shoes on the bottom of your feet like carnality or withdrawing fear or yeah. uh -huh. imaginations. Yeah. It insulates you. From the divine presence, but we're not. That's right. There are also certain kinds of shoes that are very easy to take off. <laughs> you, they could just fall off. Yeah, fall but that, off. this is not the kind of shoes that. Uh, these are like well. Bind them on, yeah. Uh, well buckled shoes. That That's right. In order to take them off, you have to. You have to actually take them off. They're not just going to fall off. Now, when we're in the framework of the battlefield, shod your feet. Amen. Shod your feet. Yes. Wearing shoes protects the sensitivity of your feet. Yes. That's and good. You, when you uh -huh. That's good. Lot, That's your feet good. Become uh -huh. callous. Yep. Yeah. But whenever you're used to wearing shoes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you, you're very aware of what's Amen. touching the Amen. That's good. Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> See, the ground you're on may be hot with fiery trial. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wear your shoes. Mm -hmm. It may be strewn with the thorns and thistles of distraction. Uh -huh. yeah. wear, wear your shoes. Yeah. Keep from slipping backward. We must have the ability to move forward with aggression without slipping backward and able to stand without being moved. Yeah. So you gotta have shoes because the battlefield's not like smooth and silky and yeah. comfortable. The only question now is, how do we stabilize our conduct? How do we make it so we don't slip or slide and injure well, you have shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, that is a difficult phrase. This is the means, the preparation of the gospel of peace. Other verses read the readiness of the gospel of peace. Made you ready with the gospel of peace. The equipment of the gospel of peace, the stability of the gospel of peace in preparation to face the enemy with the firm-footed stability, the promptness, and the readiness produced by the gospel. So this preparation has to do with what the gospel produces. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Now, I thought I'd share with you some of the versions representation of this verse. In case you're a fan of a lot of multiplicity of versions, Here's a new Revised Standard Version. Put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. Yeah, that's, a, that's a pretty uh, accepted version. Here's God's Word Bible. So you are ready to spread the good news that gives peace. Here's a new Jerusalem Bible. The eagerness to spread the gospel of peace. Here's a living Bible. Be able to speed you, uh, speed you on as you preach the good news of peace with God. 
Here's the International Standard Version. So you are ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. Here's the CEV version, contemporary English version. Your desire to tell the good news about peace should be like shoes on your feet. Hmm? And here's the Good News Bible, the readiness to announce the good news of peace. Now, all of that is baloney. And it's, in fact, a very cheap grade of baloney. It has nothing at all to do with the, our text. These are distortions of the text. These are the Bibles some people have. The preparation and readiness of reference has to do with, it's not readiness to declare the gospel. We're talking about warfare here. We don't preach the gospel to principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of the world and spirits of wickedness in high places. We don't say, Christ died for you. you know, we don't preach that to them. So this isn't talking about preaching the gospel. This has to do with wrestling, yeah. not preaching. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's right that we should be ready to preach, but that's not the point of this text. The preparation of the gospel of peace is the experience of the peace it proclaims. That's what, the, that's what it is. When, you, when the peace, it's the gospel of peace is what it's called. Blessed are the feet of those that bring glad tidings of good things that declare the gospel of peace. Now, when you believe that gospel and experience the peace, now your feet are shod. Amen. That's right. You're experiencing the peace. The New Living Translation actually very it's very different for the New Living Translation, but it actually puts it pretty well. Put on the peace that comes from the good news. That's, that's what he's talking about. Montgomery's New Testament also presents it well, shod with the stability of the gospel of peace. So this is a preparation wrought by the gospel within those who believe it. In other words, if you're going to fight, you've got to have peace. You've got to know you have peace with God. Yeah. Uh -huh. You can't venture into the battle with the principalities and powers and the prince of the darkness of the air, uh -huh. prince of the power of the air. You can't venture into battle with them not sure whether you're at peace with God. <laughs> yeah. They'll knock you down. For that matter, you have a, a heart that condemns you will knock you down before it, the devil. That's right. Amen. 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 David spoke of those who, they that love thy law have great peace. Now let me tell you, that's vastly inferior to what we're talking about. Don't be a preaching that to me. We got a greater peace than they that love thy law. You've got to see that sometimes people miss this, that Jesus has brought something new and better in. Amen. Amen. Yes, there was that peace back then. Yes, it was real, but it is vastly inferior yeah, right. to what we have in Christ. Yeah. That, would, that would have confirmed to them that they were in covenant with God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this, now we have a new and a better covenant. Mm -hmm. and so Amen. The, the uh, benefits of it are are vastly better. We're not just a little bit better. It's it's new in every aspect. Amen. Now the the power of God unto salvation is the gospel. Right. Romans 1.16 declares that. And this preparation of the gospel of peace is a demonstration of that power. That power convinces people that trust God that they're, that they're at peace with God. And if they're at peace with God, all other enemies look very small. They look very small. Yes, Judah. Having this preparation of the gospel of peace is vital to us when we're in the world because there's temptations, temptations all around. But 
this, this is a new thought to me. For you to fall doesn't mean that the devil has to convince you that you don't have peace. He can tempt you to doubt that you have peace. Yeah. Because if you doubt that you have peace, That's right. it's, it's, just, it's just as good as not having any That's at all. Right. See, when you were justified, mm -hmm. being justified by faith, we have peace with God. This is you come in with yeah. this peace. But when you rest on principalities and powers, well, actually, it's before you rest on principalities and powers. If your attention is drawn to the world, you lose your grasp of this peace. And recently, we, some of you have experienced, how shall I say this, people let you know that you wish were farther along, you know, than they are. And they, they are not as far as long as they could be. And it it's, uh, constitutes a great heart and pain, to the great pain to the heart. But the reason that occurred was they were distracted. See, and they came unto Christ. They had the peace just like you did. But they became distracted. In other words, they didn't shod their feet. They, this is something you got to do. Have, you, have your feet shod. you got to do this. Which means you have to lay hold of this truth with both hands. Not, you don't just hold it like this. you got to have it with both hands. Having peace with God. Because this is a large thing now. Considering what we were before. We were enemies. Hmm? alienated dead and now we have peace with God David uh, as I mentioned spoke of great peace of they that love thy law that was a, a pinnacle in that time but now I'm thinking of the peace that we're talking about here this is a peace that passes understanding that keeps your heart and your mind. Amen. Ah, so I have to do. Mm -hmm. Now David loved God's law. Mm -hmm. If anybody did, he did. Yeah. But there are a great number of psalms where he was very troubled about his enemies. Yeah. It wasn't because he was weak. He was a giant. Yeah. Yeah. He was a giant in those days. But this peace he had, it wasn't like the peace you've got. It wasn't a ruling peace. See, this is a ruling peace, having your feet shot with it. The ruling of our hearts and minds, that equates to shotting your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's, that's the effect of it. See, now wrestling with these dark powers... an intellectual knowledge of the fact that God is almighty and Jesus is over all and the Holy Spirit is greater than he that's against us. An intellectual grasp of those things will not shod your feet. This is a different kind of grasp. It isn't, it, it, your mind's involved, but your heart is too. We have peace with God. You're stabilized when you, you have what we call a cognizance of that, that you can kind of see the details of it. It's in 3D instead of just a flat image. And you, you see it, and it, what it does, it just stabilizes. Now you're ready to do some wrestling. There's no questions now between you and God, whether God's for you or not. Or whether God will stand with you. Or whether God's able to keep you from falling or not. Or whether God's able to make you stand or not. There's no, there's no questions about that now. You see that now. See, that changes how you fight. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Okay. Yes. I was thinking, Jesus referred to the way as being straight and narrow. Mm -hmm. so our feet need to be shod with those things that keep us walking straight. Straight, that's and right. And also, the narrowness of the way allows you to be more in focus. Yeah. So you're mm -hmm. walking with those things you're, from God that your feet are shod with, you're walking straight. Mm -hmm. and you're in the, the narrow path, which is which is better in focus. You can roll up yeah. a piece of paper mm -hmm. and, and think 
maintain your focus. That's right. Maintain a focus. Yeah, but you know, if I go out to the shop and and I want to move a cabinet and it's too big for me, I don't take out a picture of Sister Anita and say, well, there, you're going to help me do this. <laughs> See, although I can remember all the times that she helped me, it's not yeah. going to do me much good. But if you're convinced that God that, that God is with you, that, 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 that you, 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 you have, not only do you have peace with him, that, that because of this peace, he's there. He's, he's a helper in time of need. You're gonna do a lot, you're gonna do a lot more, get a lot more done in the kingdom than remembering. I remember back when I first, you know, years ago when I, I came in. Well, that's good, but that's see, this is a present. This is a very present yeah. help. You're Amen. Amen. Now the question rises: so how how do you how do you go about shotting your feet? I mean, is it well? There's not a, there's not an easy plan to this, but I will tell you that. You can do it when you're in fellowship with Christ. You're in the communion of the Holy Spirit, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. And you have fellowship with the Father, that's 1 John 1, 3. And when you're in fellowship with them, means things are, are clearer, yeah. see? Means the, the gospel you can discern is, you can discern it in more detail, yes. God is not at peace with anything unlike himself. That's right. Uh -huh. So that whenever you're talking about this this experiential knowledge of the peace that God gives, yeah, where that means that that you are aware of yeah. the fact that Christ has taken away the enmity, mm -hmm. and that you're dwelling in a place where Christ has fulfilled all the law. There isn't the offense. You're not an offense to mm -hmm. God. And so that, that introduces this fellowship and this being for Amen. you. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the things that he has promised to those who have come to him in faith. You might think of it this way, that you shod your feet when you're in the presence of the Lord. Yeah. Under the law, you take your shoes off mm -hmm. when you're in the Lord's presence. But under grace, you put your shoes on. Because as you, then as you depart, your feet, that's your feet are shod while you're living by faith, while you have fellowship with Christ, while you're in communion with the Holy Spirit, while you have fellowship with the Father. That's when your feet are shod. That's why Paul is calling the people up. You see his strategy? He's telling them what God did, how God works, what Jesus did. And he's getting you up into the holy place. And when you're up here, shod your feet. Make sure your feet are shod so you're protected. Amen. And approach to life in Christ centers in his accomplishments. It's not based on a routine or a program. A routine and a program can't produce peace like a river. A phrase Isaiah used, peace like a river. Peace is like a trickle. Any place else. Remember now, all of this is because we're facing the wiles of the devil, his strategies, and the evil day when he's launched an initiative, a militant initiative against us. It's in view of that that we're doing this. So the peace of God, when it comes to you, it comes with a warehouse of supplies. <laughs> <laughs> and it keeps the heart and the mind. In fact, it rules it. it. Rules it. I think I'll close there. It's quite a quite a text to ponder. Have now. This is something. Have this is something that he's saying is done before we proceed any further. This is this has got to be done. Don't we come to the next thing, which is a shield of faith? You have to. You have to be. You have to have a grasp of the truth. You have to have personal righteousness and godliness, and your feet have to be protected yeah. with the peace that passes understanding. Mm -hmm. Only then are you ready to do the next thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but to put it another way, then if you have those, you are ready yeah. to do the next yeah. thing. You can do it. Any of you have another, a word you'd like to add? Yes, Brother Ricky. The gospel is a proclamation of certainties. 
certainty. Because that's the right. more uncertainties <coughs> capture your heart and the mind, the more unstable you'll be. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Very good summary. Mm -hmm. Yes. And with our feet shod like this, now the steps we take, now they're going to be stable and unwavering. Mm -hmm. I think about the word that James gave us, nothing doubting. Mm -hmm. Nothing mm -hmm. doubting, nothing amen. Doubting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Brother Aaron. You know, several of us have said here that the, it's, it's the whole armor, as in like a unit, that it, it's be, to be put on. So you can't really just put, have one piece on and not the rest. And, and that is true, but I knew there was m more to it than that. And this the emphasis that you gave tonight on having being kind of the, the preparation mm -hmm. and the what goes before. So having the gospel of peace is what enables you That's right. to, do, mm -hmm. to do the rest of it. That's right. And then the next piece, above all, taking the, yeah. the shield of faith is like, is like armor for our armor. Like, That's right. Like uh, Spurgeon mm -hmm. has said. So it, it, while it is true... But it's more it's it's more generally true that you either have all of it on or you don't. But mm -hmm. there there is a yeah. an order and a progression That's right. Amen. to it, a reasonable Amen. Uh, piecing, you know, you might, put, putting it on. You might say it has to end up with all of it on. Yeah. But as you well said, there's there's a, there's a process. Yeah. Well, in that process, if you don't put on the right pieces, then you won't have it on. No. Uh -huh. You know, no. like the guarding your loins with truth. If you don't have truth, then the other yeah. things will be false. Now, let, let's say that like a person shows, a person chooses to let a, a denomination or something define truth for him. Then he'd be girt about with a falsehood. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and falsehood, no matter how sincere a person is, the person may not know it's false, but Satan will. He'll know it's false, uh -huh. and he'll come in like a horde. Mm -hmm. He knows what's true, and he, he's, pot he's impotent against truth, but he's omnipotent against the lie. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Amen. Anyone else? All right, we'll have a word of prayer. <laughs> Our dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank Thee for the whole armor of God. And the more we peruse it, the more effective we can see it is. We thank thee for making us aware of, of our enemies, that we really are not fighting flesh and blood. And when we're tempted to think so, we send reminders to us that this is not the case. Because fighting flesh and blood will, does not require this kind of armor. So accept our gratitude, thanksgiving for the armor itself and for the effectiveness that can be realized when we wear it. In Jesus' name, amen.